Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce my guest, and it's Dr. Tom Van Gilder. Tom is the chief medical officer here at Walmart. And many of you are probably wondering, why do you have a chief medical officer? Well, as uh, some of you may, may know or may have heard, we have opened a couple of health clinics in the last year, and Tom is leading our team in, in the medical field. And so, Tom, thanks for coming on. Thanks, John. Good to be here. Well, Tom joined us about a year and a half ago, and I'll let him, of course, tell you his story, but but Tom is leading uh, our medical team for our Walmart Health Clinics. We've got two clinics open now, one in Dallas, Georgia, and the other in Calhoun, Georgia, and we're, we're really proud of the clinics, but also the team there, and Tom's built a fantastic team, and you may notice there's a difference in audio and location. Well, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're in separate locations. Tom's a few hundred miles north of us, uh, and I'm in the Walmart studio here in Bentonville. So Tom, welcome uh, to the company. Um, first of all, I'd love to just hear a bit about your background and what led you to this opportunity here at Walmart. Thanks, John. You know, I really am so happy to be here. It's such an exciting time at Walmart and, and in the country. I My background is in internal medicine, uh, so primary care for adults, basically and in preventive medicine. I spent about 10 years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, mostly in Atlanta, but other parts of the country as well. And really both of those backgrounds for me made Walmart just such an amazing opportunity. One, to really help to transform the cost and convenience of essential care and become centers of well-being for the communities that Walmart serves. Both of those pieces are so important to me in terms of what the Walmart opportunity offers the chance to change how healthcare is delivered, which we're already starting, as you mentioned, in the clinics in Georgia, Dallas, and Calhoun, and really the chance to be a center of well-being in the communities we serve across the country. All of these things, when we talk about social determinants of health and public health, when we talk about the ability to really change people's lives, those are such essential ingredients. And in my years in public health, we always tried to get that kind of reach and tried to have that sort of uh, effect in people's lives. Walmart's doing it every day. So from a public health and even a healthcare perspective, Walmart is just the place to be and it's it's exciting to be here. Well, it's great and we're excited to have you here. Um, do you want to talk about um, just a second, when, when in your life did you decide I want to be a doctor? And I, th I think you have another title as well, but uh, I see a book behind you about uh, about law, but anyway, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. But what, what made you decide that you wanted to get into the healthcare profession? You know, my grandmother was a nurse, my dad was a doctor, my brothers are physicians or other doctors. So I come from a real medical family. And my dad actually tried to discourage me from going into healthcare, going into medicine in particular, because it had changed so much from his time as a small town country doctor to the sort of modernized and hospitalized and other technologized uh, profession that it became. But I, I explored it for myself and really found that the ability to get involved in people's lives, change their lives was really attractive to me. And then as I got further and further into my medical career, the idea of not only helping one person, but helping entire communities and really entire populations became very attractive. And that's what drew me into the, the public health area, as well as the primary care area that I'd, that I'd also trained in. Yeah, I got it. And where, Tom, where did you go to school? Well, I went to uh, college at the University of Virginia. I went to medical school at the University of Texas Southwestern, which is in Dallas, Texas. Uh, some of you may have heard of Parkland Hospital, and that's mm -hmm. where the, the medical school that I went to, and then my residency, as it's called, in, in internal medicine happened. Uh, that residency is the time after medical school where you really start taking care of patients, not entirely independently, but you're licensed and you, you learn from your patients. Uh, and, and Dallas uh, and Parkland Hospital in particular, big, busy county hospital is really a place where you learn so much and learn how to take care of people, not only learn the, the science of medicine, but really the art of medicine and how to take care of people and, and populations, because it's a, as a community hospital, you have to be aware of what's going on around and not just what's happening with any one patient. I went on and did a preventive medicine residency at the Centers for Disease Control. They have a a program called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And as we think about how our country is responding to the coronavirus epidemic that's happening right now, uh, that training program was designed almost, ex almost entirely for situations like this. It was designed in the 1950s to train 
practicing physicians in how to think about epidemics. And then the desire was to have people go back to their, their hometowns, their practices, and just be ordinary practitioners, but with this extra training. But it grew up into really the entire CDC came from this idea that we need to be aware of, of epidemics of outside diseases that might come in and, and spread throughout the population. So that training was really key in getting me started in, in public health and preventive medicine and really comes in handy right now. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, back to you know your training, um, what was it like and, and did you ever think you'd actually be in a situation now where you're using it at the way we are? You know, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, it, it, you, you always think as you're, as you're training in, in internal medicine, as you're training in, in public health, that you'll see bits and pieces of the things you read about in books, reading about the old uh, Spanish flu, as it was called, pandemic mm -hmm. from 1918, and getting glimpses of little outbreaks of flu or other illnesses. But to see uh, an epidemic become global, which is really what a pandemic is, an mm -hmm. epidemic that, that goes global, uh, is, is, is an amazing thing. And as, as uh, awful as some of the things are that we're seeing, I think we're also seeing a tremendous resilience and a tremendous resolve to do what we need to do, keep each other safe, keep ourselves healthy. And that's really reassuring and, and refreshing to see. Uh, but it is beyond what I really had ever thought I'd see in my lifetime. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I speak for many people and I feel exactly the same way. I, I have not trained for something like this. Um, you're fortunate that you had and and at least I think probably had some idea of what to expect and know how to react to, but um, I'm just fortunate that we have someone on the team like you that we can turn to and we and we do that many times a day. I'm sure your, your inbox is completely overflowing and has been now for weeks as well as, as your number. I know we've, we've talked several times as, as you do with many others. Um, but in a time like this, um, thinking back to what you trained for, what people should be doing and what they should be thinking about right, right now, what's the best advice you would give someone that's, uh, that's, that's at, at home with a few people right now or is working in the public? You know, John, I would say that, that there are several things that we've learned principles from public health that we're applying that are working. So things that we can control for ourselves, what you hear a lot about hand washing, for example, really does help. It helps to prevent the spread of the virus to yourself and to others. The use of what's called social or physical distancing. So keeping six or more feet away from others whenever possible and to try to limit closer contact to 15 or 30 minutes or less. Those are public health principles that are being put into practice and really seem to be helping. There are other things that we can do as well, uh, just in terms of watching out for each other, making sure that if somebody can't get out of their house, if somebody needs something, that we're taking care of them, staying in touch with them. We're really lucky uh, at this time to have electronic devices that are connected mm -hmm. so we can keep up with, with each other, keep up with our neighbors without violating that social distancing that seems to also be helping. I think the other thing to keep in mind, as is always the case with epidemics, it always feels like when you're in the middle of it or at the beginning of it, that it's just going to go on and on and on, and they don't. Epidemics always end. They usually don't last as long as we fear they're going to. And this epidemic is following that same pattern. It certainly uh, is, is a serious uh, matter, and we're taking it very seriously. But you can start to see the, the numbers start to come down in some places. We have more to go, but it, epidemics always end. So maintaining your own uh, personal health throughout this, don't be uh, afraid to you know, reach out to others and, and care for your uh, mental health as well as your physical health during this time, because it is it is frightening times. But the important thing is really just to focus on the things you can control, learn from what public health and other experts have learned from other epidemics. I know there's a lot of other advice that that is out there. Again, the, the, the great thing about the connectivity that our electronics allow us to have is that we can stay in touch Sometimes they can be sources of anxiety as you hear other people issue their opinions and things are going to change and, and we, we adjust our advice as we hear experts change or as new data come in. But really relying on what we know to be true is the best first place to start. 
be aware of, of things as they change and we continue to monitor the situation and we may change advice or change uh, what we do based on the, the data as it comes forward. But there are foundational public health principles that we're following that people should keep in mind and just stay steady in those and, and take care of each other and take care of yourself. Yeah, that's right. One, one of the things I heard uh, you, you tell a group of our associates was take your meds and meds being an acronym, M-E-D-S, but uh, move around, eat, make sure you de-stress de and sleep. Just some basic things that are great physiologically for, for people to keep in mind. Take care of yourself. I, I had a leadership class one time and someone walked in and, and said, all right, I have a question for you. I want you to take out the card that's on your table, get your pen. Now, if you, I want you to write down the answer to this question. If you don't take care of your body, where do you intend to live? And of course, you pick up your pen and say, well, there is no answer to that. Right. So if we're going to start by we've got to take care of ourselves to be able to take care of others. If you're going to be in leadership and, and lead big teams, you've always got to be ready. It's, it's like what you do. You've got to be well rested and you have to take care of yourself to give advice to others when it comes to their personal health. Um, people that are on sports teams, they've got to sleep the night before they're going to perform. They have to practice. They have to eat well. So it's just some of the some really great basic advice is think about that. Um, take take your meds, uh, move, eat, de-stress, and sleep. Those are all good. Another thing, uh, Tom, that um, we've talked about internally are, are a set of numbers, 6, 20, and 100. Uh, an easy way to remember some of those basic health principles uh, you mentioned. Would you, do you mind going through those with us real quick? Sure, John. 6, 20, 100. 6, six feet is the distance we recommend people stay apart. Again, social or physical distancing helps to decrease the chance of transmission of the virus. 20, 20 seconds, the number of seconds you should spend washing your hands every time you wash your hands with soap and water. 20 seconds, lather up, rinse off. People talk about different songs that, uh, that, the, that you can sing, the happy birthday song once or twice, depending on how fast you sing it. Some people have come up with a uh, Walmart cheer hand wash song or, or just reciting the Walmart cheer about 20 seconds. So that paying attention to the lather, the amount of time the lather's in touch with your hands and then rinsing and drying are important steps to maintain hand hygiene, 20 seconds washing your hands. If you don't have soap and water, hand sanitizer does work as long as it's 60% alcohol or more, but also again, 20 seconds of contact. Six feet, 20 seconds, 100, 100 degrees, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a fever. That's what we're saying. If you have a fever of 100 degrees or more, stay home. If you have symptoms of COVID-19, the cough, feeling achy, feeling short of breath, having the fever, any of those, if you have any doubt, stay home because that's the sort of the ultimate physical or social distancing is, is staying home so you're not out uh, in public, you're not out with other people who might be susceptible or who might give it to you. And we also say, you know, if you're at home and there are ill people at home or people who are uh, maybe at higher risk for a complicated course, like an older person or somebody with a chronic disease, try to keep your distance even at home. That's a little harder, obviously, but most, most of us can find uh, ways not to be too close for too long in our homes. And that's an important part of it too. So six, 20, 100. Well, it's good advice at home because uh, many of us have family members who you, you you love and you care for and you want to be close to them. But if they've been out in public and you have a pre-existing condition, then you do have to stay separated. Um, I've got family members uh, that don't we, we don't live with us or we don't live with them, but we've decided to stay apart right now because of some of those people that have pre-existing conditions. We don't want to be in a situation where we may have contracted it and take it to them. So we've decided in our family, just like you just said, to stay apart for a while. And we've got uh, lots of technology we can use to stay connected. Um, Tom, one of the things I've, I've heard over the years as a way to think through intense situations that require leadership are three principles is, number one is when you're in a position like this and you are the leader, then you have to lead. The second, it's important to acknowledge the problem, acknowledge the situation. So try to be as factual as you can and understand what's going on around you. And then third is you have to overcorrect and overcorrecting at the beginning can help push out some of the impacts that these things, things can have or minimize, in other words, reduce the, the impact. So in terms of our overall impacts around the country, are you seeing about what you expected you would have seen or do you think the trend is, is better than what we've seen? As you did, as you said earlier, these things do come to an end 
Is this about where you thought we would be at this point? I think so, John. You know, we, we had some experience that we could draw on from other countries that had gone through the, the kind of the epidemic curve, as it's called, earlier. So the course of the disease is, is proceeding as we thought. The, the virus is not getting worse. The illness that, that we've seen around the world is what we're seeing here. Uh, so that, that has been proceeding as, as we, I think we thought. I think the good news is, particularly in places like New York, where some of the social distancing and, and stay at home uh, measures were taken uh, a few weeks back, we're seeing that the case rates and the ability or the, the, uh, the number of people who are, who are getting sick from other people is going down. So it, it's early, but it appears that those measures are working, that the numbers are decreasing, or at least the, the number of, of, increasing, of increases during, from day to day is slowing down. Those are all really positive signs. Uh, and I think we'll see uh, similar things happening across the country as the virus will continue to spread, but with the measures in place, with the precautions people are taking, I think we're going to see uh, not the not the dramatic numbers that maybe we heard a month or so ago, but but numbers that are you know again still serious, but manageable. Right, right. And it's important that that we watch the numbers, and and if the numbers start improving, doesn't mean we should relax at that point. It means we should continue with the measure we've taken. You know, some of the things we've done in the stores. We've closed at night in all stores. We close at 8.30 p.m. We're not opening until 7 in the morning with the exception of one day a week. We're on Tuesdays from 6 to 7 where we have uh, seniors or other uh, customers who have an issue with their own health that want to come in and shop with a smaller crowd. Um, we've also installed sneeze guards at our pharmacies. We're putting them up in the registers as we speak. We've got signing all over the store reminding people to stay six feet apart. And the way to think about six feet apart in a store is about the length of the shopping cart. If you can keep the shopping cart between you and other people, then roughly that's about six feet. Um, more is always better, but that's a, a great place to start. And then uh, for our associates, we've also instituted a new lead policy. Uh, just like you said, 62100, if they have a, a fever, we've encouraged them not to come to work and, and we can cover them if they choose to stay home. And then uh, and we were, learn, we're learning every day. We just announced this morning that we're gonna start temperature checking in stores. Um, we're also going to start providing uh, masks for those who wish to wear them. And there's some things that people need to know about masks. Um, if you're going to wear a mask, there are some things that you'll need to learn about how to do that properly and understand the impact it has. And then the same with gloves. Um, gloves um, can provide some protection um, from some physical things, but just we encourage people to remember that gloves pick up bacteria the same way your hands do. So there's, there's not any protection if you turn around and then touch your face with a glove that's been exposed. So Again, um, things that people would want to know if they use this, this type of equipment, but it is all out there and we're learning every day. Um, Tom, just um, one last thing. Um, let's talk a bit, just a bit about the health clinic. Um, you do have a, a full-time day job other than helping us through this, this period and it's been great to have your help, but you do lead a, an outstanding Walmart health team. So I'd like you to just take a couple of minutes and talk about the, the business that brought you to the company and how it's going. Yes, John, thanks. We do, we have just a wonderful, wonderful staff uh, manning both the Dallas, Georgia clinic or health center as we're calling it and Calhoun, Georgia health center. And the, the transformation in those communities has really been remarkable. We hear almost every day stories from our frontline uh, community health workers, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, all the, the healthcare team that we have there that we're we're giving people options for their health care, for their health that they haven't had before, haven't had in a long time. We're giving people high quality care that they can uh, have access to, and most importantly, I think, afford. And that's been a real game changer for a lot of people. You know, there was a, a great story that came out of the Dallas, Georgia clinic, uh, a man who had come in last fall, right shortly after we opened, had not been able to see a doctor for about 10 years and had a number of health conditions that he was aware of, but just couldn't afford and probably also didn't take the time to have addressed. And he came and saw our physician there and has been back several times since. And he came in about three weeks ago as he heard that the virus was spreading and some of our healthcare workers didn't have protection. 
we've been lucky to have good personal protection equipment available and good screening procedures in place from early on in the, in the outbreak. But he thought he was a construction worker. He had some of these N95 respirators and they're not really masks. They're, they're actually things that you need to be trained in how to use as construction workers know and physicians know and other healthcare workers. He brought a box of them to the clinic because he was so grateful for the healthcare team that had been taking care of him. He wanted to help take care of them. And that's to me just a real example of how we're really touching people's lives. Uh, not just the healthcare that we're delivering, not just the, the day to day uh, checkups and things that we're doing, which is so important, but just that notion that that sense of security and community that we're developing in those health centers, I think is so important and goes, goes really well beyond what just a, a single physician or single nurse practitioner can do in the life of an individual. Also very important, but that community focus is just really so important and, and such a key part of, of what we have in Dallas, what we have in Calhoun and, and what we'll be building in the future. You know, there's so much of, of what the company's done over the years to bring people access to things they couldn't couldn't otherwise get. Remember reading stories when the company first started, we, we were able to bring assortments of merchandise. We brought access to people in smaller communities who didn't have those things. And um, one of uh, Sam Walton's famous quotes um, just at the end of his, his life was, when he said, we can, if we work together, we can help people save money and live better. Um, paraphrase, but, um, but the, the idea is that if we all do th this, this together and we do it the right way, we can bring people access to a better life. And the healthcare centers that you're leading with, it, with a team of other people, Marcus and, and a lot of other people on the team are bringing access to people that didn't otherwise have it. So the story you brought is, uh, is fantastic. So Tom, congratulations on the two openings, looking forward to more in the future and uh, a big thank you from all of us for what you've done in this, uh, this very trying time for so many around the country. Appreciate you and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, John. Say, can I add one other thing? Cause you, you said it in a very interesting way. And I, I should mention, I, I do, I teach at a local medical school and school of public health. So get a little bit into the, the teacher professor mode for a second, but in, in public health in, especially in, in terms of trying to help associates or workers of all sorts stay healthy, there's something called the hierarchy of controls. So ways that you can keep people safe and the very, the top of the hierarchy, the, the most important and best way to keep people healthy is to remove anything that's hazardous. Mm -hmm. The second way is to uh, engineer around. So build in protections. The third way is so-called administrative controls. So change how people work so to minimize exposure. And then the last way is what's called personal protective equipment, uh, which is important, but it is, the, it is some, somewhat reserved as the last resort. And I think as you laid out how we've approached our, our approach to the epidemic is very much in keeping with that. We've, we, we encourage people to stay home. That's removing people who could be contagious from, from the workplace. We've installed things like uh, sneeze guards and encouraged social distancing as a way of creating an engineering uh, solution for it. And then we've asked people to change their, their work a bit. We've changed hours, as you mentioned, we've reduced services, for example, in the vision centers. And the very last thing uh, that, that we've encouraged now is, is the use of the personal protective equipment because it is something that can be helpful in certain situations, but those other controls are so much more important. And that's, I think, where we've uh, done our best in, in trying to protect everyone from from the situation we find ourselves in. So thanks for that. And sorry to get a little a little bit professor on you, but that's I think it's important to remember that those controls, that hierarchy of controls is an important way to approach the situation we're in. No, it's great. It, it makes a lot of sense. And and uh, the order they're in is, is, is there for a reason. Number one is try to remove the threat. So staying farther apart, staying home more obviously has the biggest impact. And then as you said, then the rest, they compound the chance of us being successful at containing if they're done well. So each of those are in order for a reason. And then you've got this ability to, to layer them on. Tom, thanks for everything. Looking forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, John.